Um, before ASI, most of his career was actually in the U.S. military. He went into the uh, U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1987 and left the uh, armed forces in 1995 with the rank of captain. There's a little period of time where he did work at some outside firms, but in 1996, he came into ASI and through the years since then has now rose to president and COO. Uh, uh, Rich is a prolific analyst and commentator on the markets. He helps author and write uh, two publications for ASI. Once is a twice weekly um, uh, market alert and the other is a monthly newsletter. And for anyone who's really followed the precious metals and financial markets through the years, Rich is a name that comes up at various webinars, I mean, uh, seminars and other um, speaking engagements, really internationally. So um, I've actually been with Rich at the New Orleans Investment Conference and a few others. So he's got quite a history and quite a, uh, a level of expertise. So Rich, great to be on with you again. Uh, ditto, ditto, Chris. And uh, for those of you who uh, are new to this uh, webinar, uh, introduce uh, Chris Blasi, uh, my esteemed co-host. Uh, first, uh, he's uh, the president of Neptune Global, founded the company, uh, uh, was the, I guess, inventor of uh, the patented PMC ounce, which is a risk-adjusted uh, holding of gold, silver, platinum, and palladium with 100% uh, backing fully in the client's name, held at a depository uh, for safety. Um, its, uh, its performance has uh, outperformed uh, gold and silver over the life, right? So it's, uh, what, coming up on 15 years at this point. Close to um, it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, fantastic product. That's how we were introduced. Uh, but Chris uh, has a varied background as well. He was in the financial services industry uh, and technology sectors uh, for some 30 years. Uh, uh, he's worked with major broker dealers and boutique um, uh, banking firms. He's been quoted, uh, you know, by the who's who, uh, Wall Street Journal, Investors Business Daily, Market Watch, Street.com, USA Today, and MSNBC. Uh, and he also writes the, um, see if I get this right. Uh, gosh, I can't find it, Chris. The, That's okay. As a matter of fact, I have to, it was called the Great Reset there you go. Report, but that, that word is being used too much, Great yes. Reset, and has a lot of different meanings to people. <laughs> So we're kind of backing away from it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a fantastic publication and he, and he keeps us grounded on, on all the markets. He's got a background in all of them. Um, so thanks, Chris, for, for being here. Uh, looking forward to your insights tonight. And uh, I was telling uh, our guests, the Aiden sisters, Pam and Mary Ann, uh, how excited I was back in what, November? Uh, when they said, yes, I've been looking forward to this date. And then we, we were talking mm -hmm. about, uh, did we pick this date? Inauguration day with everything going on. Uh, apparently they canceled all the inaugural balls just for this webinar tonight. Uh, so that was nice <laughs> of them to do that. Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with COVID. Um, but uh, we've known the, the Aiden sisters for so long. My uncle who founded this company knows you back to, I wanna say the 70s, is that correct? Yes. Date it anybody. Um, <laughs> but uh, I got to tell you, their, their research is phenomenal. I, I uh, was writing uh, uh, one of the folks they work with, Chuck Butler, I think everybody knows with the Daily Fennig. And I, you know, I told him a few things about the Eden Sisters. You know, they're, they're world renowned, I believe. Um, I could be wrong, but I doubt it. Uh, they uh, are directors of uh, Aiden Research. They write the Aiden forecast uh, with Gold Charts Are Us and uh, Omar Ayalis, uh, some fruit that did not fall very far from the tree. I got to tell you, every time that we feature an article from the Aiden sisters in our newsletter information line, it spikes up to the highest readership. That should say something about, you know, how much their opinions are sought after. Um, They've spoken at every conference you can imagine. Uh, they've been quoted to talk about who's who, Business Week, Forbes, Wall Street Journal, Money Magazine, Smart Money, Barron's, London Financial Times, CNBC, et cetera, et cetera. They were featured in Women of the World. Um, fantastic research analysts. And I, I was writing to Chuck Butler earlier today, and I said, listen, Chuck, there's a couple things that I'm going to share with folks tonight. Uh, number one, the world is deluged with financial newsletters. And whenever anybody asks me, says, listen, if you have to narrow it down and you can only choose one newsletter, and I'm gonna say not information line, they'll, they'll say, uh, 
wh whose would you pick? And, and I said, you know, without hesitation, it's the aid and forecast. Uh, what they do in terms of metals, currencies, world markets, et cetera, with their charts and their analysis is bar none outstanding. Um, and like I said, Omar is not falling far from the tree. And the other thing I told Chuck, um, and again, I don't say things I don't mean, and I don't, I don't speak untruths. Um, there is one piece of literature <laughs> that is daily reading for all of asset strategies employees and that's the daily fennig i mean that's the way we start our day uh so fantastic ladies fantastic organization and i cannot wait to get into your insights here tonight i'm very proud to have you here um i'll kick it right thank off thank you yeah. yeah thank you very much it's yes. a pleasure to be here, rich uh -huh. Well, very mutual. Um, I, I want to kick it right off. We, we've got a lot of weird things going on around us, obviously. Uh, it's been a crazy couple of weeks. And I, I shared before we came on live that, you know, we're here in Rockville, Maryland, Asset Strategies is. So we're on the Metro line connected to DC. We're, we're joining the Hilton Hotel here in Rockville. And two weeks ago, our parking lot was filled with pickup trucks from the Midwest and everywhere else. And there were a lot of people wandering around the lobby of the Hilton in camouflage, all civilians. I have no idea what they were doing in town. We, you know, maybe in the news I could find something out. Um, this week, the lobby's filled with people in camouflage again. This time they're all National Guardsmen from upstate New York. And I've been out of the military for a long time, but I'm assuming Fort Drum and the 10th Mountain Division. I don't know if they're still located there. So. Um, interesting times um and you know we want to get right into the the juice the meat um we got a lot of debt piling up i think uh, it was what seven trillion in the past four years and uh most folks say we're going to eclipse that maybe in the next four years uh after today's inauguration we've got debt piling up we've got a falling u.s dollar and modern modern monetary theorists would say doesn't matter. If you can issue your own currency, who cares? That doesn't matter. But my question, and I guess I'll start off with uh, Marianne, um, does it matter? Will it have an impact uh, on the dollar uh, going forward? All this debt and uh, not balancing our checkbook as a nation? Well, it will. It will. The, the simple answer is that it will have an effect. It's already affecting the US dollar. Uh, you see that it's already dropped about 12% this year. And it looks like it's embarking on a huge fall and the fall could take it down another, you know, it could end up falling 50% or so based on the way it has fallen in previous financial crises. Now, the debt, yes, it's, it, and we understand because it's similar to like in 2008 they had to ramp up the debt in order to save the banking system and the real estate uh, calamity that was happening at that time. This time we have all these COVID related expenses, but even before COVID, the debt was soaring already. And like you mentioned, it shot up about 100% just since last September. So that's been, that has been very COVID related. And with the new administration coming in today, there's going to be more spending, more stimulus, more, um, it, it's just, it's going to continue. And it, like you said, it probably will shoot up another seven trillion um, in, in the next year, two, three, but it's, it's, um, it's something that is happening. And so since it is happening, um, and really it's interesting that a lot of the markets like what's happening. I mean, they, they, the stock market, for example, um, is very happy with the stimulus. The precious metals, not they, they've been a little sluggish, but they, they definitely um, look forward and look forward to, they see all this stimulus spending. Not only will it push the dollar down, which will boost the metals, but it will also eventually end up fueling inflation. So all of these factors will play out the thing is when or the timing and that so that's what we follow a lot and we keep an eye on what's going on and and mainly we follow what the markets are doing of course in conjunction with current events but they do very much go together and um and it's all happened before it's just that each cycle is getting or each bubble if you will is getting bigger yeah i'd like to add something is um, Janet Yellen, when she was up again in the Senate yesterday, 
she um, confirmed everything we've already knew was going to happen, but she said that she will just have the biggest spender there is. And the debt is in the background with low interest rates. So it's not a problem now. Their problem is that, and that's what they're focused on. And they'll, in other words, deal with the debt later. So this is what uh, we have on top of the almost two trillion that we're, that uh, Joe Biden's ready to spend um, this com coming right up. So yes, we're in an ongoing bubble. The stock market soared to a record high today. And so, and the st uh, gold went up, the metals went up, the gold shares went up. So I think we're going to have a very um, vibrant market this year. So, because our audience has a uh, a lot of it, a lot of them have a real vested interest in the precious metals. Uh, Marianne and Pamela, I'm going to ask for you. Let's expand on it a little bit. Um, Marianne did talk about you know the debt's impact on the metals. So I agree, the metals have been rising, right? Some people I think are discouraged because they haven't risen and hit heights that have been forecast by, by some analysts, but it's not like they aren't you know, benefiting from the policies and, and the debt and, and uh, the creation of money, which is just being of course accelerated uh, be because of COVID. And Marianne was spot on. The troubles we all have now have all been in place for over a decade, right? Now, what the, what the coronavirus has just done is just accelerated it. You know, before we got right. on, we were talking about changes in the real estate market. And, you know, there were, there, were, there were patterns that were happening, right? Migration to the South out of the Northeast, but now it's just been accelerated. But back to the metals. So if we can even unpack and maybe just look at gold and silver, um, what, why do you think they haven't, and why do you think they've been lagging some of the asset classes who have benefited from all this, you know, excess money being created, like the stock market. And where do you think they would be more fairly priced? You know, what do you think is really the fair price for, for gold and silver? Well, we think that... Well, um, well, well all right, we'll start with uh, Pam. Okay. Um, well, we think that uh, it has a beautiful upside for the next, say, five years. Uh, four to five years, we think we're, um, that it's going to expand expand into a, a beautiful bull market with silver being probably the number one. Um, not sure about the others. We're just zeroing in on gold and silver because silver has a lot more room to rise for different reasons, which we can get go there in a bit. But, but yes, we, we are disillusioned because they haven't risen in the last five months. I know that, that has turned off a lot of people when they see the stock market soaring. And really, when you compare them, um, it's, when you look at gold, it really started rising. If you want to just look at it, in terms of strength in 2018. Prior to that, it was just a, a mild rise. And, but since 2018, it's really um, shown what it has. And really, it's only since the summer when silver joined. So it's an early bull market. The, the bull market, um, if you look at it in those terms of strength, it's very young and, it, and it's just really getting started. And once this downward correction, which we think is normal, in fact, we don't even think it's bad. It's only been 14%. Uh, from the August highs to the lows of November uh, in gold, that's really for what it did in the rise is not very much. It could yeah. have, it could still go a lot lower and still be okay. That's the whole point of what we how we see it. So we're just seeing this weakness this this month um, and over the last months as um, to be buying gradually during this weakness and take advantage of it. So we see an upside, uh, like it's hard to put a number on it. Um, we're, uh, for now, we're just looking at um, $30 on silver to overcome that, the, the high, and with gold too, going up to titch. But we even think that could be a few months away. We could see some consolidation, but it's not a time to get discouraged. That's, that's our um, important point that we would like to tell people that have some patience. It may come right away. It may come a couple months, but it certainly doesn't go down much from the highs. I have well, some thoughts you. too, but Marianne, what do you, what do you, what do you think? Well, I obviously agree, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but Pam, as she pointed out, gold went up 74% in the two years, um, two years, let's just say. It's only corrected 14%. As we all know, and sometimes people just have to be reminded, nothing, no market goes straight up. Every market will have corrections along the way, 
that is just the way markets are and that's very normal little 14 percent decline granted it's it's lasted five months but it's very normal it's not it's not at all unusual and considering the 74 percent rise as pam pointed out that's not a big deal so this market is it's a young bull market we think it has a lot further to go and we think this is if anything a great buying opportunity yeah i go ahead chris no, I'll, i just have uh, to i have to interject one thing because it, it does sometimes amaze me how, how the people in gold get discouraged. When, when I started Neptune Global, it was 2001. It was the absolute bottom of the, of the gold market. Mm -hmm. And we were telling people to get in. I know the first trade for Neptune was 288 an ounce. And we were telling people gold for the long haul, right? We, we were looking at the fundamentals at the time. And if you think back, right, everyone, 2001, 2002, Boy, things really looked healthy then. I mean, we didn't have anywhere near the issues. But to put things in perspective, when we hear people in the precious metals get discouraged, especially someone who's been in for a long time, and they, and they hear about the stock market. And to me, in all honesty, the stock market is more hype than reality. You know why? Since 2001, right. gold is up 500%. 500%. You know what the S&P 500 is? 180%. Mm -hmm. So with all, I mean, so even people are like listening. <laughs> Granted, not everyone was in as early as 2001, but you've done quite well if you came in in five, six, seven. And as everyone on this call agrees, and Marianne and Pamela stated it, we are in the early stages of this leg of this bull market, the secular bull market, which began in 2001. And I was just looking at some great statistics that on an inflation adjusted basis, Gold isn't anywhere near the high of 1980. Mm -hmm. So it is so undervalued. And in all honesty, it's a longer term hold asset. And if you've been in it for the longer term, it's performed quite well. But if you're looking to see the mainstream financial media, cheer it on and keep giving you, you know, keep giving you uh, affirmation, you're never going to get it right. It's a, you have to, you have to be your own, you know, you have to really stand on your own, do your own research, and and just you know stick to your to your decision and you know what it has been rewarding us it's it's a bumpy ride but as pamela marianne said every market's a bumpy ride i mean the stock market took a beating back last month right. yeah. you know, it yes i was gonna say it's it's just confusing uh to people because we price things in dollars and dollars is like a moving target you know it's up and down as it's mismanaged you know I'm just a firm believer that everything ought to be priced in gold. You know, when you measure things, you want to have a true standard of measure. The dollar isn't that. Gold is your true standard of measure, and that's what we should be measuring everything else with. But you mentioned, you know, gold's up, you know, from the lows about 75, 76 percent. I think silver's up with about 86 percent. Um, you know, put it in perspective. Uh, couple things. One, last bull market in 10 years, gold was up 650%. We're nowhere near the end game. Yes. Silver was up a thousand percent. We're nowhere near the end game. And it was late coming to the party no. and now it's starting to do what it does. I remember the same arguments, you know, yes. I joined this firm in 96. So I saw the entire bull market 01 to 2011. Um, and I saw the horrible sentiment right prior to that, by the way. Um, and, you know, when it went over $1,000 and came all the way back, or maybe it was 750, dropped back below 500, went to 1,000, dropped back below, you know, to 750. I heard the same thing back then, but it keeps moving up. It's a step stone. That's a healthy market. Um, I knew when the Indian government stepped in and bought uh, all that metal at 1,050 an ounce, that that was the end of three-digit gold, right? I think I wrote an article about it. Well, wait right. a minute. Um, the COVID and I think more importantly, the re government reactions to COVID were kerosene on the fire that was already lit and it are right. not supposed to be a couple years into a bull market and already hit new all time highs in gold. Um, that leave that to Bitcoin. We'll get to that in a second. Um, yeah. but you know, that's not healthy. It had to correct. I'd hate it if the market was going straight up because then I know that the downfall is going to be, you know, plummeting. Yeah, you're Could right. I, too, oh. too volatile. 
And I, I know, just wanted to add one thing is that another thing that we all forget is that the business news focuses on the stock market. That's what they do. They talk about every single day, the market's up so much, the market did this, the market did that. And that's pretty much what the business news does. So people that are feeling that they missed out because they hear that, oh, the Dow was up 100 points or 200 or whatever, um, you don't hear that about gold and silver every day. You have to kind of look for it. And so that I think that too influences people and they don't realize that, for example, last year, the best performing market was silver. And mm -hmm. But, you know, and you hear all, oh, the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ did do very well, but it kept up with gold. They were about even. Um, but if you take the Dow or the S&P, they weren't up much at all. I mean, they were, I think the S&P didn't even get over 10% compared to some of these other markets, like silver was up 62%. So anyway, it's just, you don't hear that's not the top story on the business news. Once the gold got, starts really roaring in these markets, that's when they're, they start to become more popular in the business news. But that's usually the sign of, that we're getting close to a top. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just have so, to add that the, the purpose of business news is it's, they talk a buck. They talk a buck for the stock market, right? And right. Those are their advertising. The other thing about the market, you know, it's all perceptions, right? In all honesty, you know, a lot of people claim that they look at the fundamentals and they make decisions on the, on the data. And it's really not true for most cases. It's more emotional. You know, they will go on about the stock market because they keep talking about a handful of stocks that went up a lot. Tesla. They forget that the vast majority of stocks aren't doing that great. That most people are in mutual funds, right? So the mutual fund can't be 100% in Tesla. They're all, you know, it's all just uh, distributed out with hundreds of stock. And, they, and, they, and they're the ones that are really coming in with the underperformance that we're talking about. But it's almost like the magician, you know, with the, with the sleight of hand. They keep talking about Tesla and how much it's gone up or Apple or a handful of FANG stocks. But the reality is the vast majority of stocks are, you know, very, very mediocre performance. And that's what most mutual funds are delivering, extremely mediocre performance. But right. Yeah, and Chris, I'd like to add, and uh, you're saying about the S&P versus the gold price. If you index both of them to 100 starting 2018, when, when gold started catching up, to this day, the new highs in the S&P are only now on a percentage basis catching, uh, starting to be equal to gold. But only now with the rise and with gold down. And so that, that just shows you for the, since two, the last three years has been definitely a gold year over S&P. And only now is it starting to be equal with this super rise. So um, that, that's interesting. That, uh, and also the fact that um, silver outperformed NASDAQ, or they were very close, but they had an edge over a NASDAQ, considering mm -hmm. NASDAQ had so much in the news, like you're saying. So, um, yeah, it is a perspective and it, it is putting things into perspective and seeing what it is that you're really gaining because the gold shares and the resource shares have done very well this past year, which is also what gave silver that nice boost. And so that looks like a very good um, opportunity for this year, too. Well, and silver is very inelastic too. So uh, the, the bottom line is there's very pure silver plays. Uh, so you can't just ramp up production of silver because demand is there. It, it's it's going to take its own sweet time and the price is probably going to lead that. Um, we can't leave out platinum and palladium because I'm going to get hate mail. I, I do every time when I just talk <laughs> gold and silver. But I just want to make one other point. I know you, I know you ladies concentrate on uh, bonds and so forth. You know, uh, as I understand it, one of the best indicators of uh, you know the the where the gold price is going to go is the you know the real interest rates, and I think they're negative now at a multi-decade low. Uh, if you want some solace, you know, uh, if you're worried about gold in the future, you should stop because there's like zero opportunity cost to own it right now. That's right. I know that. Um, I say that my, uh, the T bills say the short-term rates minus uh, the inflation rate is negative yes and as long as it's negative it's very bullish for it and it's an excellent environment for um for the precious metals gold and silver and and so that yes that's true and 
even if the long rates start rising a little bit, they're not gonna go much. They're just in a rebound after that sharp fall, that sharp fall that we've seen. So um, yeah, interest rates are gonna stay low, which is good for, for gold and silver, and it's good for everything, actually. That's an investment. And um, so yes, that negative rate is to keep an eye on and see that it stays negative. Gotcha. Thoughts on platinum palladium? Well, platinum finally broke out too, it, but it wasn't until like November, towards the last quarter of the year. And, but it finally, you know, that it like it, after it had this huge performance in 2008, it never regained the luster that it had then. And, um, and palladium did, palladium has been on its own. It kind of just soars. That's where it was great to have the four, the four metals together at, in that platform. That's amazing because it, ha it has its own life. And like it had the auto life and, it, and it's still holding at the highs. Uh, Palladium for all its rise, it's holding, it's not going higher than a year ago's highs, but it's holding there. So, um, and, and now platinum's finally, it's been so oversold, extremely versus everything, versus gold, versus silver, versus anything you went, compare it to. It's just been uh, like a very di big disappointment. And only now we're feeling like it's gonna have some good life for it for this year. We feel good once it broke 1,000. It, uh, and it's incredible to think that was always the expensive um, precious yeah. metal. <laughs> so, yeah. do, do we need industry to kick back in before platinum and palladium do some real damage? Uh, you mean damage down? No, up, um, up further up. Do we need industry behind it? Yes, I would say. And I think uh, with silver to have that extra boost like it had since the summer, is also has some some of the copper strength in there. So uh, yes, I'd say that's why they're probably coming because they're coming into their own uh, with with the new electric cars and and the cars in general. But um, uh, platinum is coming into its own finally. We've been waiting for this moment, and it's finally here. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I do have one question. Uh, Phil couldn't be with us tonight. He's going to be watching the, uh, uh, the, the recap uh, when we come out to all registrants with it. Uh, but he wanted to know where uh, we all thought uh, the metals were going to be. I think he specifically asked about gold, uh, but I'd say gold and silver in one, two, and three years. Do we want to make some predictions? <laughs> we, have to make, we have to remember that um, a silver is extremely over, uh, um, oversold weak, cheap versus gold. So when gold, say, say gold gets to 2,500, which we think it'll get much higher, but just to look at a realistic thing for this year. Um, and we saw that the gold silver ratio go down to normal, which would be 40 and 50 to one. Um, you're looking at silver at 50, $60 an ounce with gold at 2,500. So that, that's a good example. That's kind of realistic. Um, for this year, next year, and the, but we see that it has a lot more upside after that. But that's just giving a good example of how silver uh, can easily op outperform gold. Gotcha, Marianne. Um, no, I think it's those sound like high numbers, but they're not. Fifty dollars silver was what you know silver hit that price in 1980. So that that would be very kind of a modest rise and it would double from where it is now and and this is interesting and it's not a forecast for the like the next three years but at some point with the dollar falling and all is that if we just take the percentage gain of the last bull market which i think you mentioned it was like 600 and some percent and you apply it to the bull market that began now that we're in that we say is still in the early stages gold would hit something like seven thousand five hundred dollars an ounce and that might sound outrageous but that would just be equivalent to the previous bull market and we've all talked about how things the bubble is bigger this time so really it's um you know i hate to say sky's the limit but it sort of is yeah i i know your thoughts chris um, you guys are doing a great job with gold and silver, and I agree. I just will add to the platinum and palladium, only because because of our the PMC ounce, we are very active in the platinum and palladium market. Um, and when you talk about industry, um, the economy recovering will actually just 
accelerate the rise of these metals, right? Yeah. The, um, right. You guys are exactly right. The, um, the platinum has been a laggard for a number of years. It's just starting to perk up now, and now it's perking up nicely. Uh, palladium has had an unbelievable run, and you know, logic where most people would think, oh, it has to kind of give up and it's got to have a big retracement. But I can tell you the supplies are extremely tight. Um, and the thing about a platinum and palladium, when you have a metal, metals like these that are, that are indispensable, right? So obviously we know that they're widely used in pollution control, palladium's pretty much for the uh, gas engines. Then that, the people that manufacture cars don't have the option of buying a futures contract. Right, it's one thing about gold is you'll get a hedge fund say, okay, we're going to take a position in gold and silver, but they don't. They really use a derivative, and there's really no, you know, you're not putting a, phys a demand for the physical. But when it comes into platinum and palladium, you can't build a car without a catalytic converter or a, you know, or and where you know, platinum is used in diesel. So the point is, the demand for it is real, even with a a a. a, a an economy, a global economy that's been tempered because of coronavirus, the pricing is not going down, which is just a testament to how tight the supplies are. So in honesty, like what Pamela said, any, any, de any increased demand in the industry, these, these metals are gonna run. Um, I would not be surprised to see palladium hitting 3000 by the end of the year. Um, and I expect a, you know, and I expect a, a pretty healthy gain from platinum, especially as it was pointed out, it's been so undervalued for so long. And it is the irony of it, you know, back in 2008, and really for most of the time before, platinum was always the premier, premier price metal. It's now the third price, you know, behind yeah. palladium and gold. So when, uh, when silver takes over, then then we have a problem with platinum. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, just my thoughts. I tend to 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 temper everything because it. You know, I, I always think where I sh where it should be, and I go lower. I, I tend to look for two to three times the previous bull market high, um, and that would put us somewhere around three four thousand uh, dollars. You know, by the <laughs> end of this bull market, and I think I'm being very very conservative. Okay, um, and again, I don't want it to be a moonshot. I want it to ease its way up slowly and surely because that's how healthy markets go. Um, the silver, you know, you mentioned in the 1980s, and I, 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 a lot of people called for silver to go much higher last bull market because it hit 50 and 80, uh, 1980. But I, I think that was manufactured by the Hunt brothers and the Arab sheiks. You know, right. we didn't have them in, in the markets in 2001 to 2011. So I think uh, it was a, a truer testament to where silver uh -huh. can go, this past bull market. And I, th I would expect higher by the end of it. Uh, I do have a couple questions here I wanna throw out since we're on the subject, if that's okay. Um, one says, listen, you know, as the stock, uh, when there's some sort of stock market crisis, you often see the metals sell off initially, right? and then recover before anything else as people are covering positions, they're tapping into their wealth insurance, right? Um, and then bargain hunters jump in. He said, do you think it's a good idea when the, mar when the metals pull back to temporarily get out of the market? Um, I'll throw it to y'all, but my personal opinion, an early stage bull market, hell no. Um, that's the time to be buying in because you buy well, but uh, some of your thoughts there. Well, it, um, there's a lot of energy to sell and buy again, um, emotional and energy. And if and it's exhausting for people many times to get in and out. And so it depends on what kind of person you are. If you're like more of a trader and you feel like you want to take some off the table, then definitely take off, say what you put in and let the profits rise. There's a lot of strategies you can do. And uh, but if you want to just be a buy and hold, just look at weakness as adding more to your position if that's what you would want to have more position or um or trade them but but trading meaning like every four or five months you could take some some i i always think it's good to do that when you but you have to be that kind of person that wants that if not buy and hold to us is like the best marianne your thoughts okay i i, I lost you for oh. a few minutes there but Anyway, I, I didn't know what the question was. Well, the, basically the question was, you know, as metals pull back, right? Um, do you think it's a good idea to temporarily get out of the market and then, you know, buy back in? Um, 
and basically I, I said, hell no. Uh, uh, Pam gave a much more uh, scholarly answer where she said, listen, it's really tough emotionally you know, to get yourself to get out, get back in and do that with discipline. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts in a bull market? That's true. No, I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I, I think Chris <laughs> knows this because he's heard it before. You know, I, I treat my metals at, at two different pots. My wealth insurance, which is primarily gold, maybe a little bit of junk silver for divisibility, I, I maintain my allocation. I never, ever sell it unless I have a financial crisis, period, full stop. If, if I never have one, my kids get it as a, as a start in life. If right. uh, in a bull market, I also have an additional allocation for profit that I manage. I look at that constantly, I rebalance. When we have a pullback and my allocation is lower than it ought to be, I buy more because I'm buying well. And if it shoots up like it did today, you know, then I'm looking at it and I'm potentially selling some, taking profits along the way. And if I do that all along, I really don't care where the top is. Ah. Very good. Uh, yeah, that that was cool. Like it's nice to have a strategy and, and divide it like you do, Rich. That's that's great to have non-touch and touch. Yeah. That's really good. That's good. And I would just add one thing. Yeah. The idea of um, of selling, right? You're in a bull market. You get a pullback. Selling out of position with full intentions of getting back in, which means your your real objective or your real goal is to have that metal as a long-term hold. I think is. A very imprudent thing to do for the the basic logic of the ability to market time even with pros is is not good I mean it's very difficult yeah. most people because the emotion comes in they don't know where that bottom is going to be and even when it hits no one knows and of course the feeling is well it'll go lower and before they know it it's already started to rise again of course mm. in physical metal you have the frictional cost of going in and out which isn't good and if you're in a, in a market with a serious dislocation, like what even happened back in March of last year, um, as Rich being a physical metals dealer would attest, there was no supplies for a while. Right. You, you can take yourself out of the market and believe that there's going to be this abundance of metal, but don't forget a lot of that quote unquote metal selling is derivatives. It isn't necessarily the truck being backed up and all those hundred ounce silver bars being, you know, delivered, you know, into the depository looking for a new buyer. So you can, you know, that's like a head fake, right? Oh, gold went down. It's really, it was the derivatives that are, that's what you're seeing, but the physical supply didn't really go up. So for, you know, if you want to keep a separate account for trading, uh, Rich has shared this with me before, he'll use the ETFs for that. All right, Rich, if I'm not mistaken, you'll use a GLD or SLV, not mm -hmm. as a or position of your wealth, that's kind of a trading vehicle where you can use your market timing skills. Yeah, but I, I go into ETFs. Uh, I think there's a better way to own metal as a physical metals dealer. If I want gold, I buy gold. I don't buy a proxy for gold, right? Yeah. So um, I use the ETFs because uh, I would rather be in them than the dollar if I exit a position and I don't know what I want to buy next. That's where I tend to use the ETFs. Um, I'm glad you touched on the point though about supply shortages. They happened in March. Basically we had COVID restrictions, right? The mints went to reduced production, reduced staff, shift work, et cetera. And um, there was no, there wasn't a, a shortage of metal. There was a shortage of minted, fabricated coins and bars that people buy. And premiums went up, delivery times went through the roof guess what? It's happening again. Uh, the hardest hit right now is Royal Canadian Mint on gold. Um, we're, we're being told 30 to 45 day delays uh, to fulfill because they're going back to shift work. They're going back to limited capacity and, and dropped efficiencies. Uh, so we're going to see premiums rise again. We're going to see delivery times rise again. And I know two products, I'll just throw this out there right off the top, that can eliminate that for you. You've got the PMC ounce with Chris because you're holding metal in physical bars backed up in a, in a vault. You're not worried about that one ounce gold coin or that delivery time or that premium. You also 
birth men certificates. You know, for 25 years, the premium hasn't moved. It's two and a quarter percent above spot. There's no fabrication cost, no uh, long-term storage costs, uh, and there's no shortage of gold to back it up. There's a shortage of minted coins and bars. It's happening again right now. So think about that when you're looking to add to your positions. There's a cheaper way to go than the coins and bars right now. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, no worries. Um, speaking of markets that go up in a straight line, like none of them ever do, we're gonna shift gears to Bitcoin because apparently this is the new gold. And I'd like to get everybody's thoughts on the new gold. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm actually very anxious to hear um, Marianne and Pamela, um, their thoughts. Well, so who wants well, to start off, Marianne um, this time or Pam? Well, yeah, either one, but yeah. well, Mern's <laughs> not talking so <laughs> Well, no, see, we, we are very leery. We feel it's the, um, even though it's been an incredible rise, mm -hmm. like it can be a, an incredible fall as well. It's like the um, old, old, old West. It's still a young market. It's only, it only started in 2009 and, and it really didn't start getting started till 2012 as far as rising more. And so it's a very young market. Uh, we think it definitely has a future. Uh, not, uh, there's many that came out and definitely a lot of people are going on board, more mainstream people are starting to go into it. But um, we think the future of easy moving money is there to stay and grow. And, uh, but we personally have never bought a Bitcoin. I mean, we have to admit that. So um, we can't really tell you how the process feels. Uh, we, uh, but I know we know people who just uh, just swear by it. They think it's the best thing. But to replace gold, we don't think it'll ever replace gold. It's just not the same thing. If anything, one is not tangible and the other one is tangible. So um, that alone has a lot of value and always will. So um, we don't think, uh, we think people try and, and make them like be the same. But we don't think so. We don't think it's going to be, it would be that easy. And maybe over time, but maybe not in our generation, uh, that we would see it replace gold as, um, as the number one. We don't think it would do that. It would have its own life and it would have its own reason for being good and, and useful. Like PayPal went and started using Bitcoin and they've been uh, strong as ever since. So yes, it, it is an interesting market. And a market we need to learn more about, honestly, because it is a young market. We've been watching it closely on the side and enjoying its rise and wishing we were in probably, but, um, but, but we're not. And we're not in it. We need to uh, understand it more before we would go in. But definitely, it does have a life of its own. Marianne, anything to add to that? Well, no, the only thing is I think that that's probably the most important is that when people say Bitcoin is the new gold, I just don't buy it. I mean, it's um, it's not the new gold, and it's it might someday be you know, but gold has a history of five thousand years, and so how can you compare apples and you know and pineapples? You know, it's like it's two totally different things. So yes, it's had a great rise. It's been impressive, and like Pam said, we're we're realizing, I mean, we really do need to dig in more and learn more about it. And um, we have been watching it closely. But to say, oh, just buy Bitcoin and save that for your future or to pass on, you know, to your grandchildren, whatever you want to do, or for your purchasing power, maintaining your purchasing power um, to offset the US dollar. We don't know yet if that's going to work because it it's really just getting started. So got a, that's why we're kind of taking a, a wait and see, watch it kind of view for the moment. You have some thoughts, Chris? You want me to jump in at this point or? I'll take my turn now and you can finish on the Bitcoin. So okay. I, this is a touchy subject only because the way people, they're zealots, right? And they don't want to hear, you know, if you want to just come out and say, look, just for the sake of argument, you need to, to factor in everything, even the things you don't want to hear, right? And unfortunately, you know, in a bull market, feeling is, well, it's gone up so much, it's proven itself, there is, you know, the risks, no one wants to hear about it. Um, for, for those of us who've been around longer, 
it was exactly the same about the dot-com stocks circa 1999. There were those who said it doesn't matter if the business model can't make money, all it is is clicks. Now, granted, they'll say, well, that's totally different than Bitcoin. Well, it isn't really, okay? It's something new. It's probably going to go a lot higher. There is a lot of players that are going in that is, are going to drive the price higher and will and will bring a lot of retail investors who will be enamored by the names who are taking big positions. Um, there are mechanics of Bitcoin that are being completely ignored because probably a lot of it is a lack of understanding. Um, and this is the boring part. But things like quantum computing, which is an emerging technology, quantum computing will completely undo the encryptions of these coins. Okay, that's a reality, right? So you know, this is the thing about technology. I did spend 15 years in big tech. Whenever a new technology emerged, everyone thought it was the end all, and every technology is replaced. Every single one becomes a dinosaur. Right. So I'd be really concerned about putting, you know thinking that this time it's different. This, this encrypted hashtag is, you know, is, is, is eternal. Um, also, little things like this, lost keys, and you never get your get Bitcoins back. That's a serious risk. There are instances where selling Bitcoin to clients, if you look at their account agreements, the risks because of things like that are significant. That doesn't happen with gold and silver, right? You don't lose your keys to the depository, right? So the point is, you know, I get it. People might forget where you buried it. <laughs> well, but it's not lost forever, just to the next guy who finds it. But if anyone saw, there was an article in the New York Times last week about the people who have lost their Bitcoins because yes. of their keys. One guy is out 220 million. I know people say, well, no, no, that, that they must be you know, stupid or they made a simple error, I wouldn't be. It happens, right? Um, so I, there's even people will say, well, I'll keep it in cold storage. I know because we've been in discussions with some exchanges about putting it on our platform and we've looked and there is risk even between going hot to cold plus Bitcoin, you know, cryptos being stolen from the hot wallets. So my point is it's not to pour cold water, but before someone goes overboard and takes maybe too big a position in it, really understand the risks. Now, yeah. you know, I, I think it's a it's a obviously a very attractive speculative asset, and that's what I I see it is a speculative asset. It is not a store of wealth in the same way gold and silver are. Um, by the way, there are no central banks in the world who are buying any cryptos. Uh, they're not selling the gold and they're not buying cryptos. So, and as, you know, a lot of people get especially with the younger folks, they get very enamored when you layer technology onto something, right? But layering technology onto something doesn't automatically make it, you know, something superior. Um, so that said, um, something to consider. Yeah, I've, I've written a bunch on this here recently. And I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, I, I think, you know, you look at the grayscale uh, trust commercial that's out there saying, oh, gold is clunky. What are you going to do with it? You can't carry it around. Put all your money in Bitcoin. I think that's calculated. I think it's as clever as it is preposterous. Um, the bottom line is gold is the standard, right? So if you want to have credibility, what do you compare yourself to? The standard. So I think this is a, a grab for credibility is why Bitcoin is making this argument or those that back Bitcoin are making the argument that it's the new gold. I do think there's a similarity in that there is a absolute disgust with the mismanagement of fiat worldwide. And I think the, the movement of funds into gold, into silver, into Bitcoin, that is common ground. They want to go into something that is not managed, right? Because they're so frustrated with the mismanagement that goes on with fiat currencies. But I'm with you. <laughs> We're not even a teenager yet. We're 12 years old. Gold is 5,000 years. Let's see in a little over 4,988 years if it's the new gold, um, but not today. But, and let's just, speculation. Let's, it's a speculation. And let's just put this to one thing about the crypto. So people, I mean, I, I as I say, I don't know if they fully appreciate the cryptocurrencies are completely reliant on the internet infrastructure, right? Servers, you know, uh, you have to be able to access the internet to transact and move them around and they're being stored on hard drives. A lot of people don't, and, and honestly, they don't understand the cloud. 
the end of the day, the cloud is not this magical thing. It is servers and routers that are being run and managed by Verizon and the, you know, that's what the backbone is, right? So the point is, what does gold and silver always say? If you own the physical, you have no counterparty risk, right? You have it, you're not reliant on anything. At the end of the day, it's the complete opposite with the cryptos. It is reliant, it, what value does it have unless that whole infrastructure is there to support it, right? right. It has to be there, has to be up and running, and, thing, and the technologies can't change that end up to the detriment. So my point is that's a legitimate counterparty risk that's being ignored because again, the euphoria of the price rise, it gets ignored. But it's something I believe that you know, people need to factor in and be aware of. So it's not the new gold though, at the end of the day. I got to some yeah, 2,000 of Bitcoin, so I'm, I'm up 1,500%. So I like the speculation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. I, I really like what you said, Chris, about it, because um, there is that one that you said about the technology coming into being that's not here yet, that will, that will cancel it and make it not so, um, they, they make it seem like it's so rock solid. But that is a scary thing, because we heard people that love Bitcoin will say, well, if the internet falls for a few days, like say there's a cyber attack, when it comes back, the Bitcoin will still be there. But that, like, it's not real, it's not tangible. It's, it's um, like, like, yeah, it's in, it's in your hard drive, exactly. And it sounds so exciting and really it's, it's not that, it's, it's exciting because it's moving, but it's yeah. certainly, one has to understand the risks, definitely. Yes, I agree. I think Chris, is, your points were super. And I think those are all things that we, everyone should think about. I mean, not to scare people away from it, but certainly not to put your life savings into Bitcoin. Yeah. Like I would just ask all our listeners, don't take it as a, a negative toward it. It's just what I say, a sober assessment, right? To understand your right. Risk. And that's it, right? So, you know, just, Take it as it doesn't mean I wouldn't participate in it because I don't think from a speculative position that or a perspective investment, I wouldn't like a position in it. But, you know, realize the system that supports it is extremely complex. Right. And it is the, the Bitcoin is complex. Most people can't understand how it really operates. They just you know the price is going up. And whenever there's that much complexity that be backing up an investment, there's risk. Um, so what it's worth, I guess we covered it enough, so. Uh, at this point, I think it might be a good time to move on to some Q&A. We've got some questions coming in, and at this point, I'll remind everybody, you have the opportunity to, to tap in and ask us questions. We've already covered a couple, that's why we ran a little over on the first segment, but now we're moving into Q&A. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll steer this one toward Marianne to start. Uh, it says, what do you think about the direction of the US dollar over the next few months? And longer term, do you think emerging markets will be a strong investment. Yes, I think uh, the next few months, I think the dollar's going down, probably for the next few years. And so that is based on a number of studies and patterns that the dollar has developed ever since it went off the gold standard in 1971. So it, it's kind of moved in these cyclical waves and each one lasts about 10 years more or less, eight to 10 years. So, um, and the dollar has already embarked on this new decline that really is just getting started here in the last couple of years. And so it should be going down for quite a few years. And, um, and so that too is going to be very positive for the precious metals. And then um, as far as how low will it go? I mean, that's something we don't know. We think it will hit new record lows and um, and then what was the other part of the question, Rich? It, it basically said that uh, uh, long term, do you think emerging markets? Uh, oh, the emer I think they're already looking very good. With the dollar decline so far, they've been really perking up, and we expect that's going to continue, and they will do well. Yes. Uh, Pam, is that covered, or do you want to? Well, it's pretty covered, and we uh, we do like emerging markets. We think they're going to be rising with all the infrastructure spending, with all the, the base metals and natural resources. It's going to be boosting uh, the worldwide uh, again, and that'll be very good for the emerging markets. Do you want to chime in there, Chris? Anything to add? Or 
Next no, question. it was covered very well. All right, fantastic. So uh, getting back to platinum, in this case, platinum stocks. Uh, Rich would like to know uh, uh, what platinum stocks in safe countries do you like? Mm, South Africa. <laughs> that sounds so I would just say this. I'm not a, I'm not a um, expert in mining shares, but because he put in the caveat safe countries, the thing to remember is platinum and palladium and palladium is just a byproduct of platinum mining. 80% um, of it is comes out of South Africa and Russia. You know, a little bit trace amounts comes out of, come out, comes out of Canada. So from my non expertise and resource stocks, the one thing I could contribute is there's probably very little options for a platinum stock play because if you're looking for something at a safe country, Russia and South Africa, of course, are off the table. And I don't know what kind of pure plays come out of Canada. So yeah. I, I will add to that. I'm, I'm not a, a, a mining sector guru at all, but I, I cannot think of the name of it for life of me, but there is one platinum uh, miner here in the US uh, that's worth looking into. Um, and uh, Rich, if you want to pop me an email at rchecking at assetstrategies.com, uh, I'll go ahead and find the name of that because I'm having a senior moment right now and I'll, I'll send that off to you. Uh, might even ask some friends like Adrian Day and folks to add in as well. Okay. Um, next question comes from Larry. Physical gold and silver, where slash how do you recommend it be stored safely and any concerns about confiscation? Um, and I'll throw in Martin's question as well here because it deals with confiscation says with the new administration or will the new administration restrict private gold ownership in an attempt to stop the fall of the dollar. So those are kind of linked together. Who wants to jump in first on that one? Yeah, I can. Okay, Marianne. Okay, um, I, I, where to store them? That's always, you know, it's really, we always take the view it's a personal thing. You could store them at your, in your home, you can store them in a, a safety deposit box at the bank or with a, a reputable dealer that, that will, you know, register your, your holdings and they're stored there. You have a receipt. There's a number of ways. Um, personally, I, I have always just kind of kept it at home. And um, and your address is? That... No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I was just going to say, I don't know if that's the smartest thing, but, you know, uh, I, I feel fine that way, but at least it's close by. But anyway, it, it, that can be a problem, though. Then you think, oh, well, what if you get robbed or something? But it's... Um, it's really a personal, or you could diversify, keep some at home, keep some in storage. Yeah, and, that's what I would. And, yeah. and that's probably a good thing for most people. I 100% agree with that. You know, the, the, the cheapest way to store your metal is yourself until it's lost or stolen then it is the absolutely most expensive way right. to hold your metals. So, you know, but the, the nature of gold and silver is it's there for that emergency. It's a store of purchasing power in a very liquid form for potential financial crisis you hope you never have. And if you have that crisis, you don't right. have your metal halfway across the world and you get access to it in a week or two, right? So you have to have something close you know. by. So yes. I, I, I'm an advocate of, of starting at home. That's where you need to have it. Um, best safety measure is a low profile, right? So you don't go around bragging and like, oh yeah, look at my gold coins. Um, you keep a low profile. The only people that need to know it are your closest, dearest uh, family members probably. And it's there with you up until the point where you either don't feel comfortable storing any more yourself, safeguarding it, or you think you have enough to meet any short-term need. And then at that point, I think if you have more of an allocation, you start putting it in the hands of the professionals. That's what they do for a living. And there's some right. great programs out there like the PMC ounce and Perth Mint certificates with free storage and, you know, with a government guarantee and other very reputable depositories that we work with in the Caymans and Toronto and Newcastle, Delaware. I mean, um, there are some good people out there doing good things. Uh, check with us and we'll give you some criteria as to what you want in a storage facility because uh, it's important. You want 100% insurance backing. You want all the proper safeguards and things of this nature. And we can guide you there. 
So yeah, absolutely, Rich. I think that's the it. You have to feel very comfortable and very secure with your holdings outside of yourself and in a storage, because I like them both. Uh, I mean, because we 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 got a feeling of that now when COVID came in mm. last March, when everything closed down, airlines, everything, and then if that would have stayed that way, and then you say what money can I use? If yeah. do, and then you get, all of a sudden the gold that you have hiding in your house sounds pretty good and, and to be able to go, but that's looking at the worst case scenario. But that feeling came in um, only for a little while like, because it, everything started kind of coming around. But, but it was like the feeling that you know how people feel when they do have to um, see how they're gonna get their wealth out of whatever, wherever they are. Yeah. People say use Bitcoin because you can go pick it up at someone else. <laughs> but no, uh, but anyway, Maybe. Um, yeah, I think it's good to have them both. All right. And, and there was a second part of that about confiscation. I'll, I'll uh, say my piece there, maybe hand it off to, to uh, Chris as well. You know, whether it be this administration or previous or future administrations, I, I'm maybe I'm a minority, but I'm one of those few precious metals dealers that don't believe we'll ever see confiscation again of gold. And, and unless somehow we have a major, here's that word again, Chris, reset, right? And we somehow link the dollar back to gold, there's no purpose in confiscating your gold. The only reason they did that back in 1933 was to collect up all the gold at an official price, raise the official price, in effect, devalue the dollar. Um, and then, you know, eventually in 75, they let us hold it again, but the damage was done. It was about uh, devaluing the dollar. It wasn't about collecting your gold. We're not tied to the dollar anymore with gold. We haven't been, you know, since they closed the gold window in 71. So, you know, there's no point. It's a tiny market comparative to everything else. There's no value in confiscating your gold. Uh, your, your thoughts, Chris? Or, sure, you, you, you yeah. raised points that I've made for years. And I just have to say one other thing about depository versus home. The other thing to consider is, especially this is common, we'll have investors that maybe they take a large position like silver and they're looking if silver is going to hit 50 or something, you know, they want to take profits off the table. You also need to get that metal back to market. And there's a cost to that, right? And it's slow. And if you're in, if you're in precarious times, it may not be easy to get it back to a dealer to liquidate. So, you know, I've seen that. I've seen people who had lots of 100 ounce silver bars in their possession and they're not thinking about the back end of the trade. And then when the time comes, they also found out things like, guess what? Metals were delivered by UPS and FedEx, but they won't take it from an individual back. And you, you have to work with the US Post Office. And I won't even go how there about how, how bad the service is getting. If you think it was bad a year ago, it is, we're, we're getting letters in now, you know, for like uh, from our clients that are dated from December, you know, so I don't know, it, it's unbelievable. We but, just got one yesterday from December 4th. Yep. It, 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 we mail things that people have not received that we spent three weeks ago. So, um, you know, I'd right. be really uncomfortable putting, you know, $25,000 of precious metals into the U.S. Postal Service, waiting for it to get to a dealer as, the, as I'm watching the market move and possibly against me because I wanted to, to, you know, cash in. So it's just something to consider, right? Good you got to think at the back end of the trade, right? If, unless you're holding it for, for, you know, decades and decades. But as far as confiscation, you're 100% right. Uh, dealers that promote confiscation, I believe it's really done mostly for, I would say, unscrupulous reasons and try to herd investors and scare them into a particular asset that gives them a much higher premium. In, 19, in the 1930s, real simple, we had a dollar that was backed by gold. The government wanted to put more money into the market because of the depression, and they needed gold to create dollars. Today's politician, the last thing they want to do is handcuff themselves to a gold standard, right? That's right. You can't then print just trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So the point is, it is, there is no correlation with the way we run things now and the 1930s. So I think it's a red herring. It's unfortunately done to scare people. And the probability of it is extremely small because again, just ask yourself, do you really think Washington wants to restrict themselves to how much money they can spend? Reputable dealers won't scare you into buying something you ought to own. Absolutely. So.
that should not be part of the uh, the the, uh, the process of uh, of guiding you. All right, I've got a, an allocation question here. Uh, so I'm not sure, uh, uh, maybe Pam, start off with this one. Uh, what do you recommend as a percent of holding physical metals versus metals equities? Yeah, metals equities meaning gold mining or I, I would assume that, yeah. No, I think we're apples and oranges here because one's an equity allocation, the other's a physical metal allocation, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you jump in. Well, we like them both. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, we like physical. And like you were saying, that you'll buy some a GLD as an ETF um, um, for the convenience of a, of a different type of uh, mindset of um, trading and or you know like um, speculative as you said. But um, but gold mining, we think it has uh, and silver and even more so. Uh, they have, their mines have done very well. Definitely like those two, and we we recommend several and. And so we think definitely you want to do both. You want to have physical, definitely. Um, that's very important. Some ETFs if you want with the silver too, and definitely some gold and silver shares. And yeah. we like some of the research shares as well. Do you, do you have a, a thought on uh, maybe the percentage of mining stocks out of your equity portfolio and how much out of your overall portfolio for physicals? Mm, well, uh, um, everybody's right situation now, is different, obviously. Yes, yes, exactly. Like if you're looking at the 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 pie, the the hundred percent, um, um, it's hard to say because everybody, like, it depends. If you're just looking at your investments, not your all your assets, right? Mm. I mean, looking at, I don't know. I would I would like to see like about almost half, like well, more in gold and silver, and and gold shares maybe sixty forty of what your total will be for that. Like we have a uh, fairly high percent, but it's it's really has to do with um, how comfortable you are with it. It's important that you're comfortable and start off small if you don't feel good. But uh, now with the with uh, this downward correction, it's there. Are a lot, there's a lot of very tempting things there to pick up at a better value. Anyone else want to jump in on that or next question? I would just say mining shares are not physical gold. They're two different things. They're both, they're both excellent assets, but don't conflate the two. One is still an operating company and the other is just a, you know, uh, a, a asset without counterparty risk. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And also the uh, gold shares are oh, uh, on a big picture basis. They're, they're very weak compared to gold. And so they, even if they had like a, Usually in parts of the bull market, you'll see mining shares outperform gold, like like silver does, and so you will see that. And so you, um, so yes, but you're right. One is an equity, one is a company, and you want to make sure that the the company you like the company, and uh, and that it's going to be there for the whole bull market. Uh, but yes, there is a lot of that, and it is an equity, um, and it's producing the gold. So it is two things, but but they move similarly. Gotcha. I would mm -hmm. like to add something there. And I think it's important to note that often five companies will do fabulous. And you've got over here five that don't, they barely move. And so it's very important. Um, and and uh, as Pam noted, the gold shares often, once the, the gold really takes off or silver, they will outperform. And right now they're a little bit undervalued. So they'll probably do very well, but that doesn't mean they're all going to do well. So that's where you have to be careful about selecting the, the strongest companies. And there's a lot of people that can help you do that um, if, if you really are going to go in big. And because if you want to just take, for example, a broad, like an index, you can buy something like the Gold Miners Index which GDX, it's, um, it covers the senior gold mines and it, and it, it moves well. And you'll get a, a, like a, a handful of, of gold mines. But if you really want to fine tune that, then it, that's kind of a whole art in itself, just so people realize you can't just buy any gold ship. 100% agree. And, and uh, you know, just because you're a successful asset manager doesn't mean you have any idea what you're doing in the mining sector. I really think you have to, right. for resources, you've got to go to a resource specialist, 100%. Uh, 
Um, next question, I'll stay with you, uh, Marianne, if it's okay. Which currencies look the strongest from here? Wait, there's quite a few. And the ones we like are the, the Euro, the Australian, New Zealand, and Canadian dollars, and the Swiss franc. Those are the ones we've been recommending. As the dollar weakens, they've been moving up. They're all in bull markets. They're hitting, uh, not record highs, but multi-year highs. They're doing very well, and they look like they have a lot of upside potential. And Pam? Well, um, that's basically what I, what I think. You're I on the same like page. The yeah. British, it's like a lot of currencies, even like the Mexican peso is going up. But not that we buy that, uh, but it is, there's a lot of currency just going up because the dollar is falling. So it's the dollar falling more than everything, everything else rises. And, but yeah, those, uh, uh, the commodity currencies have done really, are very well. Like um, just uh, the Canadian dollar just hit a new high today. And, uh, and so again, Australia is great, New Zealand. We, uh, we, we are very, very happy with the currencies. Gotcha. Anything to add to that, Chris? No, I'm not a, um, I'm not a currency expert, so I, I couldn't add anything that uh, brings more value than what was said. My, my favorite currency is gold. It's the only real one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but you know, what's interesting is you see the currencies versus gold. And when you look at gold and you, the euro or in Australian dollars or in whatever currency, as strong as those currencies are, the major trend in gold is up in all the currencies. Yeah. So whenever we see that, that's when you know the bull market is solid as can be. And that's what you always wait for. But then when all the precious metals are stronger in all the currencies, then it's really hot. It's really a hot market. So those are the things we keep an eye on. That, that's I will just say, I will thank um, Pam for saying that because you know, I'm just focused on the physical metals. And you know the, the, the currencies, a lot of the currencies that Marianne and Pam like are from the resource rich countries, right? So. We're right. hitting with our product set because you know we're, we're physical commodities and they're kind of hitting they're really hitting their stride now and of course countries that are rich in them their currency is doing well excluding of course switzerland but um so yeah i'm 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 kind of simple i'm just on the actual physical gold because at the end of the day at the top of the pyramid is gold right and or and all, all the currencies are moving against gold and they're all losing in the long run versus gold. It's just who's, who's devaluing quicker at this moment in time and it's more the US dollar. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, next question comes to us uh, from an anonymous attendee. would like to know, is the stock market at a bubble or correction imminent? Well, you know, um, a bubble, it always seems so easy to say a bubble because it, it's been uh, on a rise since 2009 and it just doesn't stop. But with all this new liquidity coming out, it's been, that's being um, already said by Janet Yellen, by Joe Biden, and uh, they're, they're, that's the first thing on their plate. I, I just don't see that the stock market will still continue up. As crazy as that sounds, it just sounds like um, that, it's not going down anytime soon, even though you think it should. And, and there, certainly if it did it'll go down 10, 15%, it would certainly be worthwhile to get a breather in there, but it's just not happening yet. And, um, the, and all of them, like the transportations and same with like the Baltic dry index and all that, they're just going off, off the charts. And it's, and literally we, we, our charts have to be added on. And, Gotta get um, bigger charts. <laughs> yeah, but well, we have them digital now, but but we still like a few hand ones because they we just like that every day, like a religion to uh, to update them and feel them for the day. And anyway, but yes, um, uh, uh, we think it still has. We personally think, aside from all the liquidity, it could have what this the leg they're in. It could be the last leg up, and therefore, yes, there could be a bubble, but something would have to break it. And so that would, that's what's, what's interesting. What could break it? Because if we're just looking at liquidity and optimism and a better looking economy is for coming out of the, the super low areas they're in, um, it, it still has some upside. So maybe that's where this leg is headed. Gotcha. Marianne? No, I, I, I agree. The, the easy money has been the propeller driving stocks 
higher all along. That's yeah. been the the main thing. It not not the fundamentals, not you know, if they're making a profit, not I mean so many things that you normally would look at, but it's really all the easy money. And more yeah. easy money is coming. So I think stocks are going a lot higher. Yeah, 25% expansion of the money supply last year alone. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, when people tell me there was no inflation following the uh, uh, money monetary expansion after the financial crisis, uh, 2007 to 2009, I absolutely disagree. It is in the stock market. That's where the money went to. It went to brokerages, it went to banks, and you're seeing the inflated stock prices. That's your inflation. Eventually... Right. When we have an economy that's moving again and we start putting money in the hands of consumers, you'll see your tomatoes cost more. Uh, but right now, it's all in the stock market. Right. Yeah, that's exactly all the others coming up, like you see corn and rice and um, all of them are rising. Like, uh, that, so all the soft commodities are heading up too. So what is that? That's inflation. Yep. Agreed. Chris, any Thoughts there? I was just saying, I mean, we have a financialized economy and you're right. The more they keep creating money, it just drives those assets up. And the stock market, since there's going to be no change in course with the new administration, um, maybe it'll even just the, the money creation will just even go up exponentially. So I don't see barring some sort of little short term pullback. Um, I think there'd be a quick snapback. So I, I think it would be risky to play the market expecting a crash anytime soon or a popping of the bubble. Yeah. I think if you want to get I think if you want to right. get a real sense of what the cost of things are, price them in gold. And then mm -hmm. track that over time. Tell it's me true. tell me what they look like price wise. Um, yeah. la last question I've got here. Uh, you speak of leading indicators in your forecasts. What does leading indicator for gold consist of? Well, those it? are indicators that we've uh, developed over the years, and we have various, uh, I don't know if he means our personal leading indicators or economic leading indicators, because there's certain markets you watch that lead other markets and that sort of thing. But then we have developed our own leading indicators for different markets that we follow in our Aiden forecast. So... Um, for gold, they're they're looking good all across the board. Our own and the the uh, the economy and, and inflation prospects, the easy money, all the things we've been talking about. Yeah. Anybody want to add to that? I think Chris knows my list of things I look for. <laughs> For bull market, I'm looking for the duration, you know, about 10 years. I'm looking for gold price two to three times the previous. I'm looking for sentiment, you know, when your Uber driver is telling you about all the money he's making in silver, you know, uh, those are the things you want to look for. Interest rates, we talked about real interest rates being one of the mm -hmm. best indicators. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of different things out there that you pay attention to, gold, silver ratio, et cetera. So, um, right. Yeah. Uh, and they all have to start coming together, not just one hit or another hit. You have to start seeing the convergence. Um, we're, we're out of questions at this point, but I've got three comments as well I'm going to share with you. Uh, early on when we were talking about how, don't worry, this bull market's going to be around a long time, uh, Rusty uh, chimed in and said, thank you all for helping us sleep soundly for many years. So you're welcome, Rusty. Um, <laughs> Uh, Barry came in and said, money cannot buy what does not exist. Store water and food and toilet tissue before a crisis. It was not available in March. Money was almost worthless. I've received credit card bills a month late. Took three weeks to pay my property taxes, and I only live 20 miles away. Um, no two ways about it. We live in a weird uh, era right now. Um, I'm, I'm also very confident we're going to get through it. Um, the last comment was the first one that came in right when we started up, and it's from uh, somebody that I hope everybody's going to get to meet April 21st at 7 p.m., uh, a gentleman by the name of Mikkel Thorup. Uh, he is going to be our next guest uh, here on, uh, on the move. Uh, he said, uh, thanks for inviting me to listen in tonight. Looking forward to the talk. Uh, Mikkel, happy to have you and cannot wait to get you on air uh, April 21st, 7 o'clock. Mark your calendars. Mikkel is a very interesting guy, and we're going to get to know him a bit uh, in a couple months. But uh, at this point, I just kind of want to go around and just kind of have parting thoughts. Uh, I'll finish up. Uh, I'll probably finish up, but I'll, I'll maybe start with Chris, move on to 
lovely ladies, and then I'll, I'll say a few things at the end. And by all means, let people know how to find you um, and to take part in the wonderful services or products that you offer. So Chris? Well, I'll just say, um, you know, I'm encouraged at least for the, the, uh, the markets that we're in because the fundamentals that have supported them for, you know, since I said the secular bull market began, secular does mean there is a pullback period, which we had for a couple of years, but all those fundamentals are still firmly in place and they've only intensified. So I'm, I'm very comfortable about where, where we're going for the next several years. So I think for, for investors, you can, as one individual said, sleep soundly. I think you could take a position in the metals and sleep soundly, especially for the next several years. And I invite anyone to come learn more about us at NeptuneGlobal.com. That's NeptuneGlobal.com. Rich was kind enough to talk about our flagship PMC ounce, Precious Metals Composite. You could look at its performance right there on the homepage. And we even have a tool called the PMC Calculator that lets you experience the trade. And the reason that's important, it shows you what the breakdown and the metals that you will own and in what quantities you will own them. So, um, and it was a real pleasure. I just have to say, Marianne and Pam, I've never uh, had the opportunity to work with them before, and it was a lot of fun. I hope, hope someday we'll, we'll do this again together. Yes, very much. Definitely, yeah. All right, so uh, I guess, Pam, I'll give you a first shot oh. at final words here. Uh, yeah, well, um, uh, Chris said it very, uh, very well, but I'll just um, say is that the environment today, and it's been a while, like we said, even before COVID, um, it, is a, a, a great environment for a strong bull market to continue evolving in gold, silver, and the other precious metals and, the, and their shares, because we have everything going for us. It's almost like something else has to come, that has to change, and there's nothing changing. If anything, today's um, inauguration just kind of confirmed it, um, and, and confirming the low interest rates. And then you also saw Janet like Yellen mentioned that she doesn't like cryptocurrencies. <laughs> Yeah, that was anyway, interesting, wasn't it? I, yeah, but um, they wouldn't like it. They wouldn't like it. Uh, a treasury and, and the central banks wouldn't really like it. But anyway, we just want to reinforce that. We really think it's good. This is what we watch every day. We've been watching them for 40 years. And this has been, this is like, the, for us, the third major bull market since the 70s. It's starting to develop. And we think it upside's wide open. And like buy and hold and just keep it. And, um, and take advantage of weakness when you want to add, like now, um, right now, this month, next month. But um, it just happens to be that we're on it now, and, and it's been five months coming down. So it's been really good. We, we are, ourselves are doing the same, and so we can't, um, we can't um, express it enough, in other words. It's just the environment's there. It's there for a thriving market. Good point, Marianne. And don't forget to tell us how to reach you guys, how they can subscribe to the Aiden Forecast or Gold okay. Charts R Us and the Daily Fenning. And <laughs> well, I'll tell you, our, our newsletter covers all of these things we've been talking about, keeping people, our subscribers up to date. And we do that, it comes out monthly. And, um, and then we have weekly updates because things move quickly. So every week we kind of update what's in the monthly. And then the Chuck Butler puts out his daily Fennec every day. That's complimentary to all our subscribers. And then our other service is Gold Charts or Us, which is a trading service. It's more like selecting stocks that look like what we were just talking about, that look good, that have potential. And uh, that's an excellent service. Great track record. Um, our track record has been pretty good too, I have to say, especially lately. And so um, anyway, so what we, if you want to contact us, you can write us at info at AidenForecast.com and we'll give you a free sample of our letter to your listeners. And then if you like it, you can try us on a three month trial or something like that to see if if you like it. Fantastic. And no. uh, go ahead, Pam. No, no, that's OK. It's OK. Uh, I was just going to finish up with saying, you know, uh, uh, I was looking forward to this, like I said at the start, since November, uh, you uh, matched every expectation, I got to tell you. Um, and I, I'm seeing the comments here, very, everybody's saying professional, very well done, love the Aiden forecast, et cetera. So I couldn't mm -hmm. agree more. Uh, 
Very happy to have you. Thank you. I'm honored. Um, I'm with Asset Strategies International. We're a full service metals uh, dealer, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, whether it be physical certificates, IRAs, you name it, storage domestically abroad. We can help you with all these things, rare US coins, world and ancient coins. Um, and there is a place for that, but not for core holdings. Uh, that's more of like a speculation. Um, and we can offer all those things. I, I agree with your point that the market is here and it's ripe for these types of assets. If not now, my God, when are you going to buy these things? Um, number two, uh, hundred percent agree. When you see a dip in a market and fundamentals are not changing, um, it's an opportunity. Embrace right. it. Don't fear it. My God. Uh, last thing uh, I want to say to reach us first off is uh, www.assetstrategies.com. You can email me directly, uh, rchecken at assetstrategies.com or info ASI at assetstrategies.com. Our phone number is 800-831-0007-10 better than James Bond. Last thing I want to say is just a word <laughs> of caution. We're, we're seeing it. I'm already getting phone calls now of people that say, Rich, I think I made a mistake. You know, not everybody in this industry is altruistic, is looking out for your best interests. You, have, you know how to reach us. We are an ally. Um, if you have a question, if you, somebody's pitching you to buy this certain type of material of bullion for a certain reason, just call us up. It's toll free and ask our opinion. If it's a good deal, we're going to tell you that. Go buy it. Um, even if we might sell it because, you know, I want a relationship. I don't want to trade. I don't want a killing. Um, I, I want to take care of you for the long term. And we're always going to answer those questions as if we were spending our own money and faced with that decision. Um, so by all means, bounce it off of us. <clears throat> this is a litmus test. I cannot help you after you've made the mistake. Okay. Um, so be careful out there, get some checks on what you're doing. Um, and you know, uh, it's the best way I know to keep what's yours. And I thank you all our guests and Chris, my fabulous co-host. Uh, let's yeah, thank uh, let's you. To a I wanted to say, uh, yeah. Richard, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having us. It's really been a pleasure. And Chris, it was wonderful to meet you and to work with you too. And thank so you. it's been very, very good. We enjoyed it very much. Yes, we did. And, and it was a real pleasure to to interact with you, Chris, and meet you. And Rick, Rich, of course, it's always a pleasure to be with you and interact. And we really enjoyed it. We did. It I can't wait to see you all someplace physically uh, yeah. <laughs> again. That's coming, but not today. One of these days, yes. <laughs> all right, well, Maybe. everybody be safe, be well, and uh, uh, have a wonderful day, wonderful year. Thank you. Yes. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Same to bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.